Everything you do from then on is different. One of the detectives, I think his name was He was Derek. a golden boy. And all we can do right now is come Extreme together. Extreme domestic violence, multiple rapes. Hey, so glad you are checking us out on Life Support, and we are talking about how to walk through trauma, how to get to know Jesus at a deeper level, and how to help each other walk through trauma. And Kim Perrigate is our guest again this time, and she is a licensed psychologist. And Kim, welcome back. So good to have you here again. Thank you. We were talking last time about just the um, kind of wide-ranging difficulties that come with experiencing trauma uh, in the church and um, culturally right now with the cancel culture. And we left off talking about hope and the desperate need that a trauma victim has for hope. Talk about that a little bit more. Why is hope such an a important ingredient in helping a trauma victim move forward? Part of it is the, the experience of trauma is both um, – a perceived threat to someone's life or identity, and it's also um, a huge experience of loss of control or helplessness. Um, and helplessness and hopelessness are kind of twins, as far as I'm concerned, or different sides of the same coin. One often it comes in partnership with the other. Um, when someone is traumatized um, and they feel that all of this Um, has been taken away from them or changed without their consent, without their ability to have any influence on it, it's very easy to lose hope. Um, And I think it also exposes where our hope was Mm -hmm. um, before that. Um, I think about sometimes when the news is interviewing somebody who's been through a terrible weather event or a fire and people say, I've lost everything, I have nothing left, don't have my home, don't have my pets, those kinds of things. Um, It would be very easy in that kind of situation to say, I have, there's nothing for me here in this life. I have, I'm hopeless. Um, And so for those of us who are professional healers, but also people who are in the church, providing um, markers, providing signposts to where hope can be put, Um, and that people can see a revised future, Um, even though it won't look like the way things were. You can revise your future. You can um, look for ways to move forward if you have hope for a new kind of life. So a new normal. It has to be a new normal because your old normal isn't there anymore. But your friends want you to go back Mm -hmm. to the old normal. Right. And it would take a very um, mature and very sensitive person to be able to continue to be friends with somebody who has been through a traumatic event. Um, I had a client once who, um, totally not her fault, ended up killing someone with her car um, because she was on a dark county road and there were people who were inebriated who decided it'd be really fun to lay in the middle of the road. Well, Mm. she didn't see one, and one was severely injured, and one uh, resulted in his death. And it was exceedingly traumatic for this young woman, and um, she suffered a loss of hope. And fortunately for her, she had a very close-knit small group of friends, about five other young women. And It was hard work for her, but we we got to the point where she could share with her friends what some of her symptoms of her post-trauma were, and that if she was to start doing some of those things like staring off or shaking or some of those things that her friends needed to say things to her like, this is Thursday, Mm -hmm. you're with me, Mm -hmm. you know, and so that she wasn't going back into Mm -hmm. a re-experiencing of the event. It was very difficult for her to disclose those things, but because these were such good friends to start with, it was something she could see herself doing. She worked mm-hmm. toward that. She did that. These friends were amazing. They they rose to the occasion. They did what she needed, and it was key in her moving forward into a new normal 
and being able to say, okay, that happened, but I don't have to live there day yeah. after day after day. And that's and that's what's difficult because there's a part of you knows that you'll never be the same. So right. I can speak to a couple traumatic events in my own life, and, and you know that you've changed forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that you need to keep moving. But here's where the theology of suffering is really important, yeah. and that is if we believe biblically that God has a future designed for us that includes that event, however you want to put that in whatever theological framework you come mm-hmm. from, then there's hope in that because you're not a victim of some random event and the new normal that you're being steered toward or you're steering yourself toward is actually not plan B. Right. It's still on plan A. Right. And that God had that plan for you. Right. And for me, that's incredibly hopeful because I, I there are times when I think to myself, wow, if I could just go back mm-hmm. and you know redo this again or whatever, but you can't. Sure. Right. So then you have to trust. It comes down to what do you really believe about God? Right. At the end of the day. Because God is for us, mm-hmm. and he's always been for us, even in the midst of whatever traumatic event we experience. Um, and I think um, about the verse that says, we don't have a high priest that can't sympathize with our humanness and the things that we've been through. and. All we have to do is spend 10 minutes reading about what a crucifixion does to a person's body. And we know that our Lord and Savior understands suffering. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And there were a lot of other things that he suffered as well. But suffering the death for our benefit, you know, he will listen. He knows. He's Mm -hmm. for us. And so that's where... I think people rightly put their hope. But if their hope is in trying to, you know, redo the past or, you know, somehow magically go back and, you know, like you said, if I had just done this differently, if I had just been in this other place or if, you know, I hadn't said that or, mm-hmm. you know, some of the things that people saddle themselves with. Or why me? With, the why or question. Or the why question, right? The why question is Heartbreak Hotel. That gets you nowhere because right. it's just like going in circles. Well, because you don't ha- it, you yourself can't answer that, right? And no one else can either. No one else can say why it was you. And if they do, they're probably making something up, and they're probably <laughs> hurting you in the process. So it's mm-hmm. it's better to not seek the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, it's, and again, you know, that comes back to okay, and, and you know, do I trust that God is in this or not? Now, it doesn't mean that we aren't going to go through all kinds of crazy emotions. And, the, and one oh, of the sure. things that I tell people when they're experiencing grief or trauma is, you know, if I meet with a family, for example, um, to do a funeral suicide or something really traumatic like that, uh, you know, the first thing I'll say is whatever you feel is okay. Mm-hmm. You're going to feel all kinds of crazy emotions. Um, and, you know, and... Because if we don't give ourselves permission to feel anger at God or at times we're going to feel disappointed or we're going to feel sad, whatever they are, then we're not reading the Psalms. Right. Because right. David was all over, over the, the place, place and that appeared to be okay because it's inspired scripture. Right. And But at the end of the day, David knew kind of where to recenter himself. Like he didn't get yeah. lost in that. Right. He always came back to the source of his mm-hmm. hope. And that's where our friends can help us, and that's where our knowledge of the Word can help kind of get us re-centered right. so we don't go so far off that we begin to hurt ourselves or others. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a small group once, and the there was a line in that that said, a friend is someone who can remind you of the lyrics when you forget the song of your life. And I, I think that's um, truly what, friends Mm -hmm. can be for us is to just remind us of who we are, to remind us of who God is, and to listen. Mm -hmm. Listening is huge um, for people to have hope, too, because it helps the reconnection. You know, we talked before about how trauma is disconnection, and the healing comes from being reconnected to ourselves, to God, to other people, and experiencing the fact that I am still a whole person, even though I took this huge hit. Um, 
emotionally and maybe in a whole bunch of other ways too. But I would think that's what you're talking about of narrowing your your sphere because there are not very many people that know how to really practice presence with you and mm-hmm. want to fix you or they want to just throw out all the cliches at you. Mm-hmm. And and when you mentioned that the the child who um, had eaten or, or nearly choked, mm-hmm. you know, I could almost you can almost hear people going, you know, well, we, you know, you you can't be stuck there, and you you know that's that's not that's logical. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it takes a mature person to go, huh? Well, that's that's real. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, in the scheme of things, that was a very small trauma. It was big for her at the yeah. time and at right. her age. If I chucked on a potato chip, it probably wouldn't result in the same kind of response right. because right. I have more cognitive resources to say, wow, that was dumb to be talking and eating a chip at the same time or whatever. You know, of course yeah. that's going to happen. But yeah. um, the the way we think about things is also really important. And so the we're meaning makers as people. We need to make sense out of our experience. And so if someone says to us, well, it's – you know, it's because God is getting you back for, you know, what you said to that oh, gracious. person. You know, mm-hmm. and and I hear it all. I mean, yeah, I've, yeah. I've heard people have been told just the most egregious things that, mm-hmm. of course, it only heaps more pain on yes. the situation that they have. Because you're already saying that to yourself. Right? I mean, you're already dealing with those feelings and thoughts. Absolutely. And any old tapes you have from growing up or you know what you've internalized through your lifetime all those vulnerabilities Mm -hmm. are going to get triggered off so to have a friend say well i know why this happened it happened because of this and that and the other thing Mm -hmm. is that's not a friend you need right now (laughs) Um, (laughs) yeah that's that's but a a friend who can who can say tell me about it you know you're going to be okay it's going to be hard but i'll be with you um, I actually have a very dear friend um, that went through something incredibly, incredibly painful. Um, and she told me she had her, um, what she called her A-team, and she had three people only that she confided in about what she was going through um, because it was very sensitive and it was not something that she would have wanted anybody else to know. So she found three people she could have confidence in that wouldn't be talking about it out of turn and that's what helped her build the way back was because she had people she could talk with and process with who mostly listened right and continued to accept her and continued to love on her without trying to fix any of it they were okay with who she was at the moment yeah, and absolutely. that's a really important absolutely so here we are now in a pandemic, and the whole world is in trauma <laughs> yeah. all at the same time. And not only are we experiencing that, we're experiencing racial tension, uh, incredible upheaval, economic issues. Are people kind of being re-traumatized because of the pandemic? Well, I think, again, that depends on people's context and how they assign meaning to this. I um, did some checking and some research, and... There is some indication that um, crime and reporting of crime calls to the police has actually gone down um, during this time. Um, And domestic abuse, those calls have gone down, but not to the same extent as um, the crime as a whole. Um, there, There are some organizations that are saying Uh, They are very fearful for their clients um, because being stuck at home um, with a partner who's violent or abusive um, leaves people with no way out. Um, And there's also um, a documented increase in suicides since the pandemic started. So we know that people are suffering. Uh, We know that people are having a really difficult time so what, how can we be a good friend to our to our fellow um, believers? Uh, what are we watching for? What are we looking for uh, as a, maybe a troubling sign, and how can we help? 
when you when you mean like if somebody's being struggling how, yeah or just if we know if 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 we're in touch with our friends at least at some level mm-hmm. whether it be nowadays you know text or zoom uh, zoom seems to be the you know if there is there of choice yeah <laughs> and what'll probably happen we'll get to heaven and you know and um, well, I'll be in because of the blood of Christ, but those who were at that great will probably have to go on Zoom or something. <laughs> but um, but how, what are you looking for to see if somebody's okay, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, I think that it would start with, if you've already been acquainted with a, another person, um, to be thinking to yourself, are they sort of acting and talking about the same things that they used to talk about, mm-hmm. or has mm-hmm. something changed? Um if you notice it's hard to get a hold of people, mm-hmm. you know, that you're reaching out to and they seem to never be available. I mean, who's not available? We're all at home, right? right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But I think there are people when depression sets in or hopelessness sets in, people don't answer their phones. They don't respond to a text, um, that kind of thing. So I'd, I'd look for those signs of disconnection right. or change. Um, certainly if somebody's actually coming out with statements saying I can't do this anymore or mm-hmm. you know um, I, I'm thinking about leaving my wife or my husband or something like that those are obviously huge indicators take it seriously take it seriously mm-hmm. absolutely if you're right now listening and you are in a home where you are a victim of abuse and you don't know how to get out mm-hmm. okay unfortunately that's all too common what would you counsel that person to do as a first step to get out of that situation whoever in their life they have that they can trust to reach out to and even if it needs to be kind of a cryptic message or you know um, I need to meet you at the park to give you a package or something Mm -hmm. um, so that you can communicate to someone the, the real truth about what's happening in your life, I think that that would be a first step. All of the um, shelters and domestic abuse programs are operating, um, but sometimes if you're in a home with an abusive person, you may not get to freely use the phone or or some of those kinds of things. Um, But I would try to get armed with the phone numbers of resources. Um, and if you don't even feel safe to do that, to have a trusted friend get that for you mm-hmm. um, so that when you um, make some kind of a connection, even if you plan to go to the grocery store at the same time or mm. run and get mm-hmm. gas at the same time so you can exchange that information, that would be important. I think it's important for people to know that those those organizations are still operating Absolutely. because I think that we have this you know feeling that everything's shut down and there's nowhere to go. And And the people who work in domestic violence – um, help are acutely aware that this is the kind of situation that tends to increase the incidence, and so that yes, they're they're open and they're very willing to help, and they're aware that the incidence is probably rising. Yeah, and that's one of the one of these tolls that are being taken right now, and I, I fear for when this is, if there is a time when it's actually over, or mm-hmm. we get on the other side of this, then is this going to be a lot of pent up? stuff oh, that you know, slingshots yeah. back, right? Because everyone's kind of holding it together yeah. right or now. making the attempt to hold it together. Making it the yeah. attempt to hold together. So we don't have much time left, and this has gone far too quickly. Um, just revisiting the, the whole issue of trauma, and you know, we, we know there's a pandemic, and, and we're going to come out of this at some point, but we're still going to have life experiences that happen. Mm-hmm. If you are a victim of trauma... Um, let's say you already are or there's something coming up the road that you're not expecting and you find yourself in that kind of a position at some point. Is there anything you can do to prepare yourself for that? Or are you kind of at a whim of the circumstance that happens to you? Well, I don't know that you can prepare specifically for trauma because trauma by definition is something unexpected and that we don't have any control over. But, I mean, if we are... um, working on our spiritual walk, if we're leaning into Jesus on just the daily stuff, on the regular stuff, it'll be much more likely that in a difficult situation we'll turn to Jesus. If someone's not at that point, 
Um, hopefully they're developing friendships and supportive networks um, and have good, healthy relationships so that they can turn to when things become very difficult. Right. Would it be also fair to say that we should just expect at some point we're going to experience trauma, so just be investing in your relationship with Christ and and know mm-hmm. that life is not life going is to, hard. Life, life is hard. Life is hard, and yeah. and we don't know what's around the corner. We absolutely don't. I can certainly tell, you know, as I deal with people, um, you know, the people that have invested, the people that do have um, walks with Christ that are that that are real walks with Christ. You know, they struggle too, and mm-hmm. there's obvious pain and just horrific circumstances that come with different events, but there is a calm and a presence about them that you can tell that investment is paying off because they know God. Yes. They don't understand their circumstances and they're in desperate pain, but they know God. Right. And so they have a leg up. Right. Because like Job, like Job. He, could, he could say, I know my Redeemer lives, that that even when everything else is in shambles, that was his rock. Yeah, and the first thing he did was worship. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, we we read that story and we go, "Well, that's you know, that's Job." Mm. I think Job was a human being, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, exactly. And his first reaction was, uh, "I I love God enough to worship Him right now." Right. And that's a really good, a really good teacher for all of us that when that God is still there, He's still worthy of praise even Mm -hmm. when life has turned sour right because in most cases god's not responsible for what happens yeah (laughs) (laughs) well kim it's so good to have you here this has really been helpful because i think all of us are looking for tools um to help our friends to to help our families and to try to stay healthy ourselves as we navigate all these things that happen so thanks so much for being here Thanks for having me. It's, it's Kim Perrigate. Yeah, it's great to see you. And she's a licensed psychologist and shed a lot of light on this issue of suffering. And what we're doing here with Life Support is trying to connect you with Christ uh, in a deeper way through suffering, through trauma, and not to see it as an aberration, but to understand it as uh, something that can draw you closer to God. 